Welcome to Jumping Bomb Audio. Welcome back to Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about the world of Joshi Pro Wrestling. Welcome back once again, and a very special Happy Halloween. By the time you listen to this episode, it won't be Halloween anymore, but I'm still going to wish all our listeners a Happy Halloween. I hope you had a Happy Halloween. Uh, And once again, the trick to my treat, joining alongside me, is my great co-host, Kelly. Kelly, Happy Halloween! Happy Halloween. I'm currently hiding from trick or treaters. Oh, great. I don't get uh I don't I live in an apartment building, so I have never gotten a trick or treater before in my in, in they my They normally life. don't come around by my house, but like every now and then they will, so it's like we never get candy just cuz we don't want to get a whole bunch and then it's like, "Oh, a kid shows up." Yeah. But I also found out like last year that everyone might think I'm actually a kitty fiddler because apparently if you don't have your porch light on, that means they should stay away from your house. And our porch light doesn't work because like the bolt, the uh, na- not the nails, the screws on it are way rusted over. So I've never been able to take it off and replace it. So hopefully no one in the neighborhood thinks I'm a kitty fiddler, but they might. I thought that the having the light off just meant that it was like, I don't have any candy. That was always the thing. It was like, don't come here. We're not home or like, we don't have any candy. So just, yeah, like, I heard recently house. it's more like stranger danger stuff now. Like, Blech. oh, <laughs> but if you were to be someone who would cause an issue, wouldn't you just turn your light on? You would think. And then people be like, it's like, safe. I mean, that's like self-determination police... of whether yeah. you're safe or not. I mean, maybe they send like cops around today and like search to make sure the registered offenders aren't handing out candy. Uh, maybe. Well, what a kickoff to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about uh, registered sex offenders. Anyway, um, Here's all our plugs. You can find us on Twitter at JBomb Audio. This week, we sent out the call for questions and got some good questions. So we'll be covering that in a little bit. You can also follow me at Tay Mambo and Kelly at Comic Geek Kelly on Twitter. Uh, wherever you get this podcast, wherever you're listening to this podcast, we ask that you subscribe to us. It would be a big help. And if that place where you subscribe is Apple Podcasts, Give us a five-star rating and review. We would really appreciate it. And if you're feeling very generous on this Halloween or this post-Halloween for you, you can donate to us at redcircle.com slash shows slash jumping bomb audio. So we'll get right into it. We're going to start by reviewing the Seedling Show from October 27th at Shinkiba First Ring featuring two matches in the Beyond the Sea Tag Team Title Number One Contendership Tournament. But first, the show kicked off with a just a regular old tag team match between Kari Yoniyama and you defeating Mei Saruga and Riko Kaiju in 10 minutes and 31 seconds. Kelly, what'd you think of this match? I thought it was a fun opener. It felt like nice and energetic. Uh it got a little long to me for whatever reason. I mean, 10 minutes isn't very long, but near the end it started to drag for me, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good time. I My opinion on you is that a couple years ago, and I've talked with this uh, with some people about this, is that you was like everywhere. She was booked like in every promotion, all these tag, like title matches she was getting. She was like everywhere, and it became sort of like oversaturation. Yeah. For me, and I sort of was like, uh, and then she went away and she's come back and, you know, she's not my favorite wrestler on earth, but I've enjoyed seeing her. And I think it was fun to be able to see someone like Mace Ruga, who I've seen a lot, who tends to wrestle sort of people 
you know, she's uh, on the small side and she sort of wrestles people who are also on the small side, but it's, it was a little bit more fun to see someone like you who's, who enables May to do maybe some different things just based on the size difference between the two of them, you know, do some different things based on her side. So, so I enjoyed, um, that was probably what I got most out of the match. It was a pretty basic, uh, you know, opening tag match. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why, but at some point I like imagined that you joined Stronghearts and believed that happened and that's why she wasn't getting booked as much. <laughs> but I don't think that ever happened. I think I just made that up. No, she was injured. I don't even remember what her injury was, but she was injured um, and so she was out for a while. Pro Wrestling Eves, I still think she's promoted yes, as right. Pro Wrestling Eves U, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. Although I think Pro Wrestling Eve just started running shows again oh. for the first time in a while. So I think it is. A, I don't follow Pro Wrestling Eve uh, beyond sort of just seeing it on maybe on Twitter once in a while. So if I'm wrong about that, someone can tweet at me and tell me. What's going on with Pro Wrestling Eve? <laughs> pro Wrestling Eve. You can tweet at me at Tay Mabo on Twitter. Why is Pro Wrestling Eve problematic now? Let us know. <laughs> the next match was the only singles match on the card between Ayami Sasamura and Hiroyo Matsumoto, which went to a time limit draw in 15 minutes. I, as I've talked about on this podcast before, am a big fan of Ayami Sasamura. I think she's very talented and is probably underutilized. We were talking about how you was uh, used everywhere. Ayami feels sort of underutilized for what I think. I think she's very talented. Uh, I thought this match was fun. As people know, I'm not a huge uh, fan of time limit draws, uh, but I think they had some fun sequences. They had some fun strike sequences closer to the end of the match that I really enjoyed with some good uh, forearms and things like that. But another sort of, uh, this is probably going to be a running trend of this show is, you know, another match that I was like, yeah, you know, pretty good, you know, three star range, but w didn't go crazy for it. Yeah. I liked the use of the time limit draw here because it felt more like they were showing that Sasamura could hang rather than, Oh, we don't want to beat either of these two. So like, I thought that was a good use of it. Um, I went like three and a quarter on it. I thought it was fun. I thought it was a good match. There was one bit where like the cameraman lost their mind and like shook the camera around and then zoomed in and out a bunch of times. And whoever was cutting it together was just like, yep, this is the shot. Use it. There were a couple of interesting camera because later in the show, the camera kept, there was one camera that kept like turning off or something. Yeah. Well, and, and then be I like... realized later it was just, zoomed way the hell out or way way zoomed in on the just the blankness of the ceiling or whatever yeah it was just weird because the first time it happened i'm like oh did the lights go off in the venue like did yeah. the lights go off did they lose power but then they quickly switched to another camera but then it like kept happening yeah it was and i was weird. like hmm is the camera yeah, like, like losing battery yeah because like the third time it happened all of a sudden someone's giant head was there and i was like oh okay <laughs> What is happening? So, well, the perils of uh, live streaming, uh, live streaming wrestling, I guess that would Kevin be Dunn stepped in. He's like, guys, I got this tonight. <laughs> the next match, the semi uh, main event of the show, the show only had four matches on it, was the first match of the Seedling Beyond the Sea tag team title number one contendership tournament between Asuka and Makoto and Tokiko Kirihara and Yuna Mizumori with the Las Fresas team emerging victorious in 14 minutes and 36 seconds, getting some Choco Pro uh, style action here. So I will kick it over to Kelly for his thoughts. This match really showed, it's another one of those where I'm going to say it showed the wrestler that Kirihara could be like the potential is there. She just hasn't unlocked it all yet. Like near the end of the match, she was getting, she looked pretty good with like a bunch of cool, nasty looking throws and submissions and stuff. But then before then it's all her not wacky offense, but like 
up, I'm doing the claw and just stuff that doesn't look effective at all. And it's like, no, there is the good wrestler in in here. <laughs> just you need to pick a lane and please let it not be the comedy lane because that one doesn't work very well. Yeah, it's interesting seeing, you know, I know that a lot of, you know, May Saruga wrestles a lot outside of Choco Pro. Yuna does as well. But it's always interesting seeing these people sort of in a more traditional setting, especially like Seedling, which to me, the sort of wrestling style is, except for the high speed stuff, but that's usually, op- you know, opens the show or maybe it's a second match or something. But seeing these people sort of in a more traditional, straightforward uh, wrestling environment and sort of seeing what uh, work, what really works and what sort of doesn't work or doesn't sort of read in the same way. I think there's a lot of things at Ichigawa, Ichigawa Chocolate Square that sort of read differently with, you know, a tight camera on a mat than they than they do in a ring in a bigger, you know, quote unquote, bigger venue. So, yeah, I sort of saw the same thing where there was a couple things with both of them, with Kirihara and Mizumori, where I was like, ah, that's a Chaco Pro thing and it doesn't really work here. <laughs> like, I get what you're doing and I've seen it before, but like in a regular sort of match, quote unquote, I was like, hmm, OK. And they were also I mean, they were benefited, I think. By working with two people you know, and Asuka and Makoto who have been in that environment. They've, they've also been in both environments. Now, of course they wrestle more, you know, in sort of the traditional wrestling, but I think that they probably were helped out by wrestling people who weren't total strangers to them and could probably better bridge the gap between the two styles than maybe other wrestling, you know, someone like Hanako Nakamori would have been able to. Yeah, totally. That definitely helped, I think, because they were able to when they went for like the more wacky offense, they knew, okay, like this is what I need to do to sell this and make it look like it's not this ridiculous thing, even though it is. It's kind of like when you'd see the occasional Chikara wrestler outside of Chikara and you're like, what is happening here? This this is like when the uh, colony would show up in Ring of Honor. It's like this is cool, but at the same time, this doesn't entirely work. (laughs) Yeah, and the and the wrestlers from Chikara who I think did best were the ones who were able to sort of change their style. Yeah. You know, I think some of that was sort of like with the Chikara stuff was more like gimmicks and they were so stuck in some of those gimmicks mm-hmm. that were very sort of not lim- I, I guess limiting because you're mm-hmm. like, oh, who are you? You're a ant. Yeah. And then it's, it's like, just a okay, totally different environment. Yeah. At least with the Chaco Pro stuff, like there aren't really a lot of, you know, like Antonio Honda's different. He wrestles elsewhere, but like Yuna Mizumori, it's not like her gimmick is, you know, she's a, a human pineapple or something. <laughs> um, she is just sort of a wrestler, which I think benefits them when they go out. So mm-hmm. even if they're doing the wacky things, it's not like a double leap of, you know, where it's like, oh, you're doing these different moves, but also you're this crazy gimmick. It's like, she is a wrestler. The gimmick is wrestler. Yeah. So I think that probably helps. That's probably the biggest difference between that and Chikara, which always had these sort of over the top, like over the top gimmicks that only sort of vibe together in the world of Chikara, which was sort of its own. I mean, which really is its own separate thing and its own separate world where like the rules are different. Yeah than elsewhere but yeah it's, it is a it is an interesting comparison although i think it's more on the wrestling side um, definitely things for, sure. for choco pro yeah i thought but i thought the uh, choco pro team sh- showed a lot of good fire and i thought they looked good coming out of this match uh i went three and a half stars on it yeah i also enjoyed it and i would love you know i'm always down to see more uh you know, different people in seedling, they have such a small roster, uh, you know, like an actual roster that I'm always like, Oh yeah, bring in people that I haven't seen here before. And maybe, you know, one of them really clicks and, you know, does really well. Like we'll talk about in the next match, but I'm a, as I've said many times before, I'm someone who really likes variety and bringing in new people, uh, to this promotion is one way to get variety. So I was happy to see them 
you know, in the tournament, not moving on, but having what I thought, I agree with you, was a very solid match. I'm telling you, if you like variety, I got a little company called the World Wrestling Entertainment to tell you about. <laughs> I think I'll stop you there and we'll talk about the... <laughs> And we'll talk about the main event, which was also in the Seedling Beyond the Sea tag team title number one contendership tournament. I don't know why I insist on saying the full title of the tournament every time I announce a match, but the main event, Arisa Nakajima and Hanako Nakamori defeating Riko Kawahata and Yumika Hoda in 17 minutes and 33 seconds. I really enjoyed this match. I thought it was really what you sort of can expect from these sort of smaller seedling shows where you'll get a good match. It's maybe not the blow away, you know, match of the year contender. You might get on a Corican or something like that, for example. But I thought it was really strong. I think bringing in uh, Rico and Yumiko Hoda closer to the beginning of the year has been one of the really great moves for seedling uh, in terms of getting some new people in here. They've run some interesting things with them. And I think that they're both very good in that they mesh with the style of, you know, someone like Arisa, uh, Nanai, for example, you know, the sort of the signed roster without feeling like, Oh, it's more of the same. They feel different, but they fit in very well. So I thought that this was a very strong match and a good main event. Yeah. This felt like this is the, the seedling house style. Like this is kind of what you expect and what you want when you watch one of their shows. And I liked it. Uh, The second half was awesome. Once everyone kind of just started throwing bombs. Uh, I also went three and a half on this one. Yeah, I think this is really, you know, it's not a match you're going to go out maybe and be like, Hey, so-and-so person who hasn't watched, you know, seedling go search out this match. I don't think it's at that level, but I think it shows that they really have a consistency to these sort of things. Even on this smaller show, you know, there's only 150 people. It's at Shinkiba First Ring. It's not a huge show, even though that this is sort of the small tag team tournament. It's like this was a solid match. This is what I would expect from something like this. And that they have sort of this baseline where even on these smaller shows, you're going to get very solid wrestling. You know, some of these smaller promotions, it's like they have their big Corican show. They load up the card. It's like, this is really all their good matches. And then they have these sort of smaller shows and it's like, you're not going to see much of, you know, you're not going to see much of anything you can skip. I think all seedling shows because of the quality of the wrestling and also they're constantly running. They're very good at running these storylines. You know, the, tournament isn't really a storyline but it makes this sort of smaller show feel vital beyond just hey we're throwing four matches out there with you know our roster and enjoy it's like there's yeah, a reason to watch like the a show. House show right or like a road to or something so overall i thought a strong show maybe not one to you know run out and seek out but if you've got i mean between there was a lull i think the match started the first match started like 30 minutes into the video that I saw. So the whole show is only like an hour and a half, I think. Yeah. Um, if even that. So it's very, it's a very easy watch. If you're looking for something to watch, uh, I would say, uh, check it out. That's my review of the show. Yeah. I enjoyed the show quite a bit. All right. So we are now going to move into the questions portion. We got a number of questions on both Twitter and Uh, through the Voices of Wrestling Discord channel as well. And so we are going to run through all of these. Some of these are for both of us. Some of these are just for Kelly. Uh, So I will point those out when we get to those. (laughs) The first one is from Sam Roberts on Twitter. Thank you for this question. As we approach the end of the year, which companies do you think have spent 2021 trending upwards and which have spent the time traveling downwards? Well, I guess I'll take the obvious answers here uh, from Kelly and say I think probably the two promotions that have most obviously been trending upwards are probably Stardom and Tokyo Joshi. Um, I think it's very clear that they have sort of separated themselves. You know, obviously Stardom is the top level, but I think also Tokyo Joshi has separated themselves into sort of their own tier 
sort of like a level two tier. Because I'm trying to think, really, there doesn't feel like any promotion that sort of has the momentum. You know, they're maybe not drawing humongous crowds, but they feel like they have some momentum. Yeah. Obviously, Stardom is running these sort of bigger shows. And as much as Kelly and I maybe have issues with the booking, it's been clear that they are drawing more fans um, running bigger buildings. They feel like a bigger deal. They're getting talked about now sort of more consistently outside of the sort of bubble of Joshi wrestling. So I think that they're an obvious choice in terms of traveling downwards. You know, I don't really want to, I would say this, and I don't mean this sort of in a derogatory way, but I talked a lot about at the end of 2020 about actress girls. And I thought that they could really, sort of break out, you know, they launched a streaming service. It just felt like sort of there was some sort of momentum building with them. They were being talked about more, you know, that they they were a promotion that largely didn't often make tape in years past. So it was hard to even see them. Now there would be a streaming service. And I just felt like they sort of had the sort of their style felt like it would be something that could catch on and really sort of grow. Um, And I think for a variety of reasons, one being they've had some, you know, big injuries that have taken some bigger names out. Obviously, they've had some people leave and uh, go to stardom. And it just feels to me like they haven't quite gotten to where I thought they would be in terms of building momentum. It feels like they haven't really built much momentum in 2021. Uh, now we'll talk about in a few minutes, they've, they've kicked off this um, storyline feud with uh, Osaki Goon from Oz Academy, which I think is interesting, but it just feels oh. to me like it hasn't quite all come together in the way I thought it would. You know, the streaming service is nice, but the stuff that gets put on the streaming service is often, you know, put up a month or two after the event. And my belief in wrestling is that, especially now that you have access to so many wrestling promotions and they all have streaming services, you know, we're talking about WWE, AEW in the United States, and that's only two of the companies in the United States, but you have New Japan, you have DDT, you have NOAA, All Japan, um, Tokyo Joshi, Stardom, all these sort of different promotions, you know, the seedling shows are streaming. It's always tough to me to make the case for, you know, I understand that they're trying to sell uh, the DVDs, I think is why they come up late. But I think you're always going to have an uphill climb in terms of sort of building momentum. If your streaming service is like, yeah, here's an event from one month ago, because by the time that's up, it's sort of like the world of wrestling has moved on. There's been hundreds of other events that people are probably thinking about or talking about and things like that. You know, it's something that stardom really annoys me with stardom that they don't live stream on stardom world. And I think that they've been lucky enough to now they have a major corporation backing them. And they're obviously, they had a head start. They're the biggest Joshi company in Japan. And so I think that they've sort of managed to avoid that issue. Although I think it's still, is an issue for their growth and they should be live streaming their shows. It's a little bit different for actress girls who's a smaller promotion, but actress girls would be my answer just in the way that I don't know that they've traveled downwards. I don't think I would say that, but they certainly haven't felt hot in the way that I thought that they would. Yeah. I would say, I wouldn't say anyone really had a downwards trending year. I feel like everyone stayed kind of steady. Um, Tokyo Joshi was probably the biggest trending upwards for me just because I think they've had a they've had a really good year. And the only thing that gives me pause with stardom is what are their shows going to look like back when things fully open up and the cost of running buildings goes up? You know, are they still going to be able to run these big shows and bigger venues or are they going to go back down to smaller venues? Yeah, that really is 
And I've seen a couple of people bring that up. I mean, that really will be the question in terms of what does the schedule look like? As we talked about last time, I mean, I think that they have sort of been running a lot of these shows because they can get in the buildings. I would sort of like to see them um, sort of maybe not run less shows, like as a total overall volume of shows, but I'd like to see them maybe pull back a little on these big shows, especially because I think they might need to once these venues become full capacity. Cause you know, running these gigantic venues with like 1500 people in them uh, is probably not a moneymaker, but I would just like to see them sort of strengthen the Corican's. I feel like the Corican's have been very much sort of moved on from. Yeah. And they run um, Corican all the time and kind of just give it, crap shows to be honest like and i would love to see like if they come back and they're running all these corican shows you know i'd like to see 16 whatever the full capacity is 1600 people in there because they've done it before and i think there's going to be a balancing act between you know once corican opens being like well we've sort of built the corican shows to fill the sort of half capacity corican at six 600 700 whatever it is and they're gonna have to change their strategy because the type of cards they've been putting on are good enough to get you know maybe 600 people in there but are probably not going to be would not be good enough to get 1600 people in there yeah and that's going to be sort of the new i think they're going to have to reconfigure some thinking i don't know what that answer ends up being but I, i i think you're right I think they'll be able to do it because I think they do have a good amount of momentum, Mm -hmm. but I think it's not going to look the same as it does now where it's like, here's a big show in uh, Oda Ward. Here's a big show at Osaka Joe, like every single month. Yeah. And it, it hopefully they don't end up just being like, Oh, we'll just business as usual. Just keep pushing on. Cause I think that could really hurt the company. So we'll see how things go, but I, I do think they'll make the necessary changes. Um, I also think before we leave this question, I would say that probably, you know, I'm a bit confused as to where Marvelous lands now because they had that sort of exodus of talent. Um, And it feels, you know, not as if they've gone downwards, but they have. I think they're probably the company that has the most question marks for me going into 2022 in terms of like, what does this look like? I mean, they booked out a bunch of Corican's for the end of 2021, which now sort of, in hindsight, I think was supposed to be sort of building of this uh, 3AW title matches and things like that, which haven't sort of panned out and just saying, you know, I don't know what 2022 is going to look like, but it's sort of, they're, they're the least stable promotion for me i feel not that they're going to close or anything but you know a promotion like wave or oz you know they go into 2022 they're going to run their shows they're going to do their thing they don't have many question marks as to you know what's this going to be like yeah it's just it's steady it's just like okay this is your position you're not going up you're not going down you're just staying there but we will move on to the next question which is a total uh 180 from talking about the present to talking about the past. Um, If it wasn't for the 1997 financial crisis and all Japan kept all their top talent, what would have happened to the company? Would they be like Noah where business eventually drops due to the lack of new stars or would they have made new ones? Who do you think would have filled those roles? That question uh, from our friend Tim dog on Twitter. Um, You know, this is an interesting one. I feel like they probably would have ended up shutting down regardless, just purely because it's like, there's no, uh, there's no Joshi companies from that time still left around anymore. You know, it's just, I don't know. I just, I don't think history doesn't show that they would have survived all this time. Yeah. I think the star thing is the biggest, you know, we can't predict because we don't know. And maybe, you know, with, not the financial crisis, they would have lucked into a number of people. But the fact that almost no one from that period, really the biggest problem with almost all those companies that's that sort of branched off from all Japan was they couldn't make any stars. 
Like yeah. no one could make any stars. You know, Gaia ran for only 10 years and they sort of grew. They had some time where they were pretty big running essentially, you know, some angles that were more sort of based on nostalgia. So weren't even like, Hey, we have these new stars. And then it sort of fizzled out and went away. Uh, you know, pro- there were problems with other promotions, you know, like Neo, and they they just couldn't make any new stars. Like no one could do it, and I'm not sure if they were all together that they would have been any better at doing it. Um, you know, it's like who would have filled those roles? I mean, I think largely you look at the you look at who was around then. It was really the older guard. Um, you know, there was people like in Gaia, Mako Satomura, but she wasn't even real. It wasn't like Mako Satomura came around to Gaia and she was a huge star. Yeah. She was still sort of on that second tier. I mean, she would, um, sort of based on my memory of, you know, looking at all this stuff, she was sort of second tier on shows that would draw pretty well, but it would be you know, Chagusa on top or things like that, you know, stars, bigger names. So I think that it probably doesn't implode the way it did, you know, in real life in terms of that the whole scene looked like it was going to fully just disappear. But I think there's probably a world in which, you know, maybe the company sticks around and it's not, you know, it's sort of not what it was. I think of JWP, which became Pure J. And nowadays, I'm not sure anyone outside of the hardest of hardcore fans could tell you any single thing about Pure J. The company's still didn't around. Know Pure J came out of JWP. Yes, the whole thing was, well, it was a, I think it was a copyright. Uh, thing with one of the TV networks or something where they couldn't use the that trademark anymore. So they just said, oh, we're changing the name. But even at that point, it wasn't what it was. And that was a company that had lasted that whole time. Yeah. And it's just an, another part of it is that All Japan was obviously incredible, but that sort of success doesn't happen you know, it doesn't happen really for 50 years, almost nothing, you know, movie franchises or TV shows like the world and people's interest is not sort of built in that way to sustain something, especially something that was at that level where it was like, these are the best wrestlers in the world. They're incredible. Oh my God, we're connect. You know, that was like a rare thing. And like I said last week, <laughs> If wrestling was easy, we'd have 50 wrestling companies that are all insanely hot and everyone would love wrestling. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to sustain. And All Japan, frankly, was lucky to do it as long as they did. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's not like we're saying the Joshi scene couldn't survive it because it's like, look, from 1997 to now, what wrestling companies that were around then are still around now? Like the only ones I can think of off the top of my head are New Japan and WWE. Yeah, it's like, like, all, like these... all Japan itself is a completely different company at this point, so that doesn't count. Um, was Big Japan established in '97? Big Japan was. A step. Well, I'm trying. I don't remember what year they were founded. I know that they were around in the late '90s, but I don't remember yeah. exactly what year. But they were around then. But again, it's not like Big Japan was the biggest. Co- you know. Yeah. So it's it's just slightly like, easier to be a small company for 20 years than it is to be a huge giant. Yeah. You know, conglomerate for 20 years. Yeah. So it's just it doesn't these companies very rarely survive. Like it's a one in a million chance. I mean, we got a reminder this week with all this announcement about ring of honor. Yeah. You know, ring of honor go not going away, but it's going to be revamped. I mean, that's a company that's just under 20 years old. Yeah. Just shy of 20 years. And, you know, 15 years ago was, you know, not big in terms of worldwide drop, but it was a huge thing. And then it's hard to it's hard to sustain. 
Yeah, and it's, so, they're owned by a giant media company, so it's not like they don't have money backing them. Yeah, so I think maybe All Japan would still be around. Maybe they're a very small company, but who knows? Maybe in, I don't know, 2003, some company comes in, like what happened with New Japan, and they get bought by some company, but maybe that company's worse, and it closes, you know. Yeah. Those are sort of the things that you can't guess, because... Even stuff, you know, Bushi Road buying Stardom, I think five years ago, if you said, what's the future of Stardom? I don't know how many people would say, well, Bushi Road will <laughs> uh, purchase a company and then they'll get really big. And it's a thing where, you know, Stardom is is building and building and we'll see, you know, what happens. And that sort of peak of the company could last for 10 years. It could last for 10 months. I don't know. Um, we're Are seeing it with New Japan. That- yeah, are the rumors that Bushiroad is looking to sell Stardom still around? Because like I remember hearing those a couple months ago, and it's like, what is the source of this? And like, there's no proof of anything, and people are like, no, oh, they're we... looking to get rid of them. Yeah, I had heard it was like, oh, there's a rumor going around, but this was like a year and a half ago or something. Yeah, it was like right as the pandemic had started, and it was like, oh, they f- they might think this, is... but I haven't heard anything since. It was like, hey, there's a rumor going around. I can't imagine. I think monetarily, I haven't looked all that closely at the numbers. I think they're doing very well in terms of sales. Oh, def- they'd have to, be, um, I think. Money. So I can't imagine why Bushi Road would want to get rid of it. And it seems like a fairly, you know, they're running shows, they're going to these bigger buildings. So, you know, I think it was maybe just a confluence of like oh the pandemic is hit and it seems weird and then there was the stuff with the risa and then there was all the hana stuff and you know i think it was a thing where you could start that rumor and go oh, they're looking to sell and you looked at what was going on with you know pandemic they had no crowds a terrible tragedy with hana arisa leaving and people could probably say yeah maybe i would want out of the you know <laughs> it was maybe a rumor that was started with no facts, but it had enough sort of background to make it at least partially believable. Yeah, that would make um, sense. But I can't see any world in which they would they would do that or they would want to do that. You know, if they really... I, I'm surprised Bushiroad hasn't done this yet with... You know how they have the, uh, the trading card app for New Japan? Mm-hmm. How have they not done one for Stardom yet? Well, it's very weird because they used to do stardom trading cards. Yeah. Because the whole thing was the True Hearts cards don't have stardom wrestlers in it because stardom has always done their own cards. And it feels like with them building momentum and selling more merch, they would want to do those cards again, but they haven't. Like that just seems Um, like printing money. Yeah, I really... um, I really have no idea because I agree with you. I think it would be an easy a thing to make a lot. I mean, cards in general nowadays. Yeah, yeah and it's like you don't even wrestling. need to have them be physical car- physical cards. You've got that New Japan app. And like that, by all accounts, seems successful. Like I see people dumping money into that thing whenever I use it. Like new people where it's like, all right, I have just a whole bunch of five star cards. And I'm like, you had to spend like, Forty dollars to get this. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I assume it'd a, be even bigger with Stardom. Yeah, I am not a digital uh, card collector. I do get well. I get the True Hearts cards every year, but those are you know physical cards. Just because I'm like digital buying something digitally, that I'm like I want to be able to hold it and be like, yes, this is a yeah. thing that I have. <laughs> Yeah, I've never put any money into that New Japan app. It's just something I pop open every now and then and look around at stuff. Well, Kelly, I think the next question, it wasn't aimed towards you, but I believe that the next question is for you based on what it is. It, uh, it Colin sure Matthew, does. Colin Matthew on Twitter asked, has the Ruaka rage lessened any since she beat Unagi for the title? I mean, I don't know. I think she still sucks, but like... I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. <laughs> a stern parent <laughs> giving stardom a talking to. Yeah. Just tell your new champion to sell more and then we can talk. 
Well, and we'll be talking about her in a little bit when we preview the upcoming uh, st- big stardom show that has a future of stardom title match on it. So we'll have more words about Ruaka. Uh, we'll get to talk about more about her coming up. The next question is the first question from our discord. And it is look back at a few of the champions from a few promotions. And in some words, describe their reigns, basically what you think of how they did. Uh, so we'll start with stardom and we'll, and they asked about, uh, this is from Velkage Braca on our Discord, the Voices of Wrestling Discord. So Stardom, Utami, Julia, and Tom. Well, I will say, I think some of this we sort of covered um, in our last episode. But Julia, I think they did very well. I think it was really perfect in that they gave her the title when she needed a title to sort of give her a boost. They gave her a good reign in terms of time, defenses, things like that. And then they used her loss to sort of boost someone else up. I think that's sort of the ideal way to go about, um, you know, having someone win and lose a title. Mm -hmm. You win a title to help someone out. When you lose a title, you should be helping out that next person. And to me, I feel like Julia losing the title, she didn't really lose much of anything at all. So to me, that was sort of the ideal reign. Utami, I'll say that I think Utami won the title at the perfect time time i know we talked about it on this show on this podcast that we really thought it was her time to win the title uh and she did i think that there has been as i mentioned last episode i just think there's been that little bit missing from utami's reign um i don't know if it's you know maybe a big feud that's sort of more than just like i want the title to really give her this reign definition um, they sort of have the Suri thing now because she's challenging for the title again, but that sort of feels not planned just because they had the whole Julia injury. And we'll have to see who does she lose the title to? Does that help? What happens after she loses the title to her? Things like that. So that's still up in the air. The one I'm least sort of jazzed on, as people know, is Tom. I think they did really well having her win the title in this huge match. She had a lot of momentum. And it just feels like they haven't really followed up on the momentum. It's like building blocks. They like. Her reign is. Go ahead. Her reign is just ice cold through no fault of her own. Like the matches have been good, but it's just the booking has been lame and like really feels like a second tier title, even though they had her beat Utami. Yeah, and it just f- feels like they put down a really strong building block to build the rain in terms of she beats Julia in the big hair match. And then it just feels like they didn't, re- they sort of slipped on the follow up, and you have a building block and you haven't put anything on top of it. So it still feels like it's sort of way, it feels like she's sort of in the background. And then at some point they're going to be like, now she's the major focus. But if that was going to happen, I would have hoped it would have happened in the last six months. Yeah. Um, and just has not seemed to happen. And again, maybe she loses the title in a way that sort of makes the rain better, but you know, she now has to lose the title and it feels like she doesn't have, she feels like someone like when she loses the title, it's going to hurt her because she doesn't have the strength of a rain to sort of be like, Oh, it's okay. Like she lost, but she has all these great, you know, defenses and a lot of momentum. Yeah, like if she came out and challenged Utami for the title and everyone would everyone would just be like, but you just lost and you don't seem like you should move up to a title shot yet. Next up from Tokyo Joshi, the four, uh, Rika Tatsumi, Miyu Yamashita, Kamiyu, and Hikari Noah. Um, Rika, I thought, was a good title reign. I think it was a sort of good, uh, I don't know what, a, what I want to call it, but sort of you know, an establishing title reign in terms of it wasn't super long, but I felt it really did good for her as a wrestler. Uh, the me one, I'm sort of more up in the air about. Uh, it hasn't been bad, but I'm just sort of waiting for the... I feel like since she won it, I've been a bit confused about like, what is the purpose of this? Because I think the purpose for me has to be, she, you know, she's won the title now three times. So this isn't really establishing her. She's obviously already very well established. Who is she losing it to? 
does the loss help? I thought it would be Maki Ito. It yeah, we thought Maki we knew Ito. the purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was my whole thought. Once she won it and once they had the uh, one to one million tag team and then Maki winning the Princess Cup, I was like, well, clearly that's why, because they have this connection between the two of them and she's going to lose a title. Now that's not true. And I'm like, well, what's this rain for? So it hasn't been a bad rain, but I think there's a key element of it missing to define whether it's like this was the right decision or this was not the right decision. Yeah, my opinion on it changed changed drastically after the Maki Ito match. Because like I I really, really like the rain, but it's just like, okay, this was the clear end point, but now we're past that, so what the hell is it now? I mean, the good thing with Miyu is that she's such a good wrestler that you're guaranteed to get good matches at least. So it's yeah. like there's a baseline as to there it won't be a rain where you're like, ugh, this was horrible. Like it was horrible. I only got f- four four star matches from this, re- you know, something like that. Like, is this one where they just give her like a year and a half, almost two year long title reign? Maybe. I don't know. I sort of have my eyes on the um, January fourth Corican because I think that's sort of the next big benchmark. And I'm like, if she keeps it past that moment in time then I really am like, okay, what is the next step? Yeah, because I'm just going to look at it now, like what the longest title reign is in that company. And maybe they just, they want her to be the record holder. I mean, she might already be. I think it's, holder. I think she already is the record holder. Okay. So maybe they want her to pass that. But maybe I just knows. don't see that very much as, I don't know. They don't seem super invested in the story of like, ah, she's a multi-time, like she's setting records. She's multi-time this. Yeah. So that's sort of a, that's a to be determined for me, I guess is, is my end answer. Uh, Kamiyu, I thought was very good. Um, I thought had a good reign that elevated her. Uh, my concern with when she lost the title was, would she be able to keep some form of momentum? And I think that she has kept the momentum. Obviously, she's not quite at the level that she was when she was holding the title. But the biggest fear was sort of the secondary establishing title is you get the title and you're like, yeah, you're established. And then you lose it and you sort of just disappear. Um, and I think that they've done a pretty good job after she lost the title in preventing her from disappearing in that way. So to me, it was a plus. Um, and you I know guess I'll wrap here though. Old McDonald. You're right. That's what disappeared. <laughs> God, I haven't thought about old McDonald in so long. I think Who'd about it thought? literally every time I see her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I don't. I'm just like, maybe that's the strength of, I thought the title reign was very good that I'm like, <laughs> just someone just knew. that's it. how strong it was. That's how strong it was that I forgot about old McDonald. <laughs> I w- so I what I think they should do is keep the opening of her current song where you hear her talk like, "Hey guys, it's Camille," and then Old MacDonald kicks in. I think that works even better. I think I think at this point you can't go back. You're yeah. they're, they're full speed. Or maybe they break can't. it out for like big matches. Yeah, that would be uh, <laughs> that would be good. She uh, and she goes against uh, Miu at a sumo hall. They just bust out old McDonald. <laughs> and finally, Hikari. Hikari for me, her, Hikari Noah is another sort of TBD uh, because I sort of have to see, like with Kamiyu, what happens after she loses the title. I mean, she could have the title, really, technically. I don't think that this will happen. She could have the title for another year. Uh, and I think that would probably change my thoughts on it. O- you know, versus if she loses it in the next month. Um, I think they've done well. I think they haven't done quite as well as they did with uh, Kamiyu with that title. Um, But I think that it has been strong and I think it's a good sort of, they've established the belt. I think the two reigns have really done a good job establishing the belt as sort of this up and comers uh, sort of belt. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think her her run's been pretty good with it so far. I like, um, is that hardcore match coming up? Is that for the title? 
Or is that just a hardcore no, match? No, I don't think that's for I think that's just a hardcore match. I think her next title defense is against uh Miyu Watanabe, I think. Okay. See, I think that that should have been a title. I think match. that's in the just notes. Make that her thing, you know? Like I she's going to be the deathmatch idol. Just keep going that way. It would be interesting to establish it as like I if you want to challenge for this belt, it has to be in a hardcore match because I want to do hardcore matches and I'm the champion. Yeah. Sort of like champion decides. Um, I just don't know if the promotion like wants to go in that way of like all our big shows are going to have a big hardcore match on it just because it's sort of a different vibe than mm-hmm. the rest of the promotion. But and I like that they're going back to having it on the inspiration like she's doing that, um, doing the hardcore match again. Um, but yeah. Uh, and finally, Ice Ribbon, the, the first one, uh, Suzu Suzuki. Um, I really like Suzu Suzuki's reign. I thought it was a really good, another sort of establishing reign in terms of getting her the title. I think the more sort of interesting title reign, and I'm sort of thinking ahead and assuming, but I think the second, her second title reign is going to be more interesting to see exactly what happens because I think this one was more of of just she is capable of winning. You know, she's capable of having the title. She's not going to be a super dominant, you know, forever champion. But now you know that she can win the title. She's established at that level. You know, she went away. She did the hardcore stuff. So I'm really fascinated to see how the second reign builds on the first because I think the second reign, I think there's always excitement. Like when someone new wins a title, there's always a base level of like, oh, this is exciting. They've never had the title before that you can't get away with then on the second title reign. But I think the second one is almost more important because it's going to be like the quote unquote, like real one that shows exactly what kind of wrestler she is. Um, yeah. That but first I think, title reign felt like when you see a movie and it's got like a child actor and a prominent role and on the credits, it does the and introducing so-and-so like true grit and introducing Haley Steinfeld. Like that that's what this one felt like. That was the and introducing Suzu Suzuki to the world. So the next one is gonna be the is there are they a one hit wonder or are they gonna keep going as a star? Yeah, exactly. I mean I think that's a good that's a good metaphor and we will see because I think probably that's coming sooner rather than later, especially now. Although Suzu, as we'll talk about in a second, may soon be a tag champion. So maybe yeah. that's the next step in her in her journey. And then, yeah, even of course, without the title, she's had a killer year. Well, yeah, they've managed to keep her very hot and she feels like one of the major focus points and stars of, of that company. Uh, and then the second to Sukasa Fujimoto, uh, her title reign and also Sakushi's IWQ title reign. Uh, I guess I'll loop sort of these both in because I feel sort of similar about them. I mean, I thought Fujimoto's year started really strongly. Like she was to me very early on, I think like in April or maybe May, she was like runaway favorite for wrestler of the year in terms of just having repeated great matches over and over again in these title matches. I think it sort of slowed down a bit in the middle of the year and has picked up a little bit. And I think her next Uh, defense against Sakushi could be very good as well. Uh, So I think it's just been sort of a solid hand at the, at the wheel, um, which may be, you know, I don't think it's bad. I think some people have been like, Oh, it's just sort of, you know, like this person who's already been established just sort of holding onto the title. But I think they're sort of moving the pieces around below her to sort of set up the next thing. And it's nice to have someone with the talent of Tsukasa Fujimoto to sort of be there, have good matches while you're sort of building for the next, you know, point two, three, four, five, six, whatever it is. And Sakushi yeah, IWGQ an extended uh, transitional title reign almost like because typically you think of that as like, oh, it's a month. Here you go. You get everything ready. But this is kind of it needs more stuff to build. So it's like, OK, we need to put someone that can hold the belt this long in that spot. Yeah, and I think that Sakushi's reign was very similar in that it's just an established person who can hold the title, is going to have good matches, and then you can use that to 
sort of set up what's coming down the road. I mean, I've said on this podcast, I think Sakushi is maybe one of the most underrated, not within the sort of world of Joshi, but someone who I think should probably get more acclaim in the wider world of wrestling and doesn't often. Um, but yeah, two very solid, maybe not over the top, you know, notable reigns, but very solid. You know what you're going to get. You're going to get good matches, uh, which for me, when I sit down to watch wrestling, I want to watch good matches. So perfectly fine with me. Yep. That's all I need. The next question was based on something uh, I tweeted out that Ryu Mizunami should defend her seedling beyond the sea title on AEW Dark now that she's in the States. And Rika Tatsumi in our Discord asked, uh, what title defenses seed beyond the sea, seedling beyond the sea title defenses I want to see on AEW Dark? Um, I'll throw a two. I mean, I think the obvious one is Emi Sakura. I think that they could have a very good match. Uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. My other one is uh, Kylan King is someone I really like uh, on Dark who has sort of, I think she's really solid. She was on the NWA and Power Show and I thought she looked really good. But she's someone who weirdly has sort of not moved up with that crop of Dark people that have sort of established herself as sort of the next level up like the um, like Red Velvet... Um, I'm thinking of like, even like the captain Sean Dean, like those sort of that level of talent, like the people who started when dark exploded into like 25 match shows and have gotten on dynamite in sort of lower level roles and things like that. And I feel like Kylan King hasn't really gotten that opportunity, but I feel like she's a very solid and could probably have a good, um, match with Rio. So those would be my two. Yeah, I definitely think Emi Sakura would be an awesome match. Uh, I'd like to see Ty Conte in that spot. Like, I mean, I, I she doesn't win the title, obviously, but I think that would be a really good match. And hell, if you're looking to change the title, fly Asuka over. Or Vaney, I should say, at that point. Have her win the title on Dark or something. I think that would be cool. And get more people interested in the promotion, hopefully. Have Jade Cargill win the title... Hell and yeah. go back to seedling. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Let's do it. Can you imagine she she appears at uh, Corican? We'll just say to make it easy. And oh, she's there. Whoo, she's big. And then she has a face off with Oscar. That would be great. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I feel like dream. people would lose their minds seeing her walk out just because just she looks incredible. You know, <laughs> it's just yes. like what a striking human being. And I think it would be great. And I think that, you know, as I've said on the show, there's a, a big crop of AEW rest, women's wrestlers who could benefit. You know, it's been very tough with the with all the COVID stuff happening. But I think that, you know, Jade Cargill's one, Ty Conti's one that would really benefit from just going over there, not even having to stay. I'm not talking about staying for six months, but just go over there and sort of wrestle that different style, wrestle with some different people, um, I think would be helpful. I think Jade, you know, to me, has that sort of high athleticism that Asuka has. And I think being in the ring, being around her, training with her would be a big help for someone like Jade. And then the second question from Rika Tatsumi is about Rika Tatsumi, which is, do you see Rika Tatsumi as a baby face or a heel? Uh, my answer is I see most people beyond the obvious heels of like Neo Bishiki Goon in Tokyo Joshi as baby faces. So I see Rika Tatsumi as a baby face. Yeah. I mean, I've never once considered her being a heel. So I think that just means she's a baby face. Well, that's an easy one. The next three uh, are what I have marked down as Kelly questions. So Kelly, I'll allow you to both ask and answer the following questions. Okay, so these are from my friend Mahoney. Uh, The first one says, Kelly, which co-host would you pick if you had to pick someone to put their finger in your mouth each night as you sleep? I think Mahoney assumed there's more than just the two of us on this show. So I get... I. Taylor, you're you're putting your finger in my mouth. Yes, great. <laughs> I feel honored. I feel honored to be picked among the long list of people you could have picked from. 
Well, all right, fine. Let, let's even just throw Aaron in there. I still, I, I'd still pick you. Oh, wow. I hope Aaron <laughs> is listening to this now. And... Aaron, I'm sorry. Aaron, you, why not? You can put your finger in my mouth too. It's all right. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> uh, question two. If you theoretically found a dead possum in your driveway, would you just throw it in the street like a lunatic or carry it a short distance to the forest? Okay. This is not what happened. The possum was not in my driveway. It was on my sidewalk. And so I picked it up with a snow snow shovel and threw it in the street. And it's not a short distance to a forest. I don't have any forests near me. If I were to take it to a wooded area, it would be across like four blocks. And I'm not carrying a dead possum four blocks. I'm just going to throw it in the street and let the world take care of it. I was going to say that this question sounded like a targeted question of an event that had already happened. <laughs> Look, sometimes you just come home from work and there's a dead possum on your sidewalk. And you wonder, I, are you playing possum or are you actually dead? And then it's 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 just dead. Yep. And then there's one more. There's one more. Uh, would you rather put one ant in your pee hole or a whole bunch of ants in your butt? I think I'd go a whole bunch in my butt. What about you? No, this question is for you. I'm leaving you to hang on this. I'm leaving you in the to hang in the wind on this one. Because I mean, like, the logic I use is items are supposed to come out of your butt. Items are not supposed to come out of your pee hole. So when the items are going to come out, the butt's the only way to go. All right. Well, there's no good way to transition out of that into uh, what else has been going on the last two weeks in Joshi Wrestling. So that's how I'll do it. Uh, we'll like start so with so many ants in my butt. Here's all these matches. Yeah. Uh, Stardom had uh, two more shows in their tag league on the 30th and 31st. Uh, we're not covering those on this show because they're not up on Stardom World yet. Uh, on the 30th, Momo as the team of Momo Watanabe and Azumi defeated Wakasukiyama and Lady C. Utami and Sai Aphrodite defeated Hanan and Rina, whose team I believe is called Oil and Water. Uh, <laughs> Starlight Kid and Ruaka defeated Mina Shirakawa and Tom Nakino. Natsupoi and Himika defeated Saki Kashima and Fukigen Death. And Mayu Watanabe and Rin Katakura defeated Micah and Shuri, Ponytail and Bushido. Uh, on October 31st, only three tag league matches, Utami and Sai Aphrodite defeating Unagi and Mai Sakurai. Shuri and Micah defeating Momoaz. And Himika and Natsupoi defeating Hazuki and Koguma. So just two shows for them, although we'll have a lot to talk about in stardom coming up. Did Michael Oz. pick up like a finger guns gimmick? Because I feel like anytime I see a picture of her on Twitter now, she's doing finger guns. Like, I, I did she turn into Kenny Omega recently? Like, what's going I, on? I think it's just a cool thing. To, I think finger guns are just a cool thing to do. I mean, they are cool, but it just it seems new for her. Like, she didn't used to do that. Uh, that I don't have an answer to. If you know about <laughs> Micah's finger guns, tweet at Kelly. <laughs> Is Siri just like, hey, you need to jazz it up? And Micah's is like, how about these? And she's like, God damn it, you genius. All right. Uh, Oz, big things going on in Oz Academy as they have started a feud with Actress Girls. Uh, they had two shows on the 24th. One was the Akino birthday party where the team of Blue Maya Yukihi teamed up with Miku Aono. Uh, to take on Osaki Goon, but my Yukihi betrayed Miku in the middle of the match. Uh, so that all will be continuing as Sayori Ano went to Actress Girls and brought in, surprisingly, brought in Osaki Goon. Wait, so it was uh, the other my Yukihi in disguise? It, uh, I believe it was. The the results on the Oz website said it was the blue my Yukihi, which I believe is the good. Yeah. Maya Yukihi. I'm not sure if it was. I think it must have been in disguise. Yeah, because they are two um, separate people. Yes, as they have two separate Twitter accounts. 
I'm not sure of the exact lore, like if they've ever met before or anything like that. But yes, it turned out uh, that she betrayed Miku uh, very callously. So that will uh, be going on. They're all building to the, uh, they have a uh, their usual, I think their usual December 30th Korokin show. Um, Hiroya Matsumoto faced off against Rina Yamashita on, on the 24th. And after the match, they decided that they will be teaming up to challenge for the tag titles at that December Korokin. So that was the other big event on the Oz show. Uh, Tokyo Joshi 2 sort of house shows, but lots of news coming out of those shows. Uh, one to one million, the team of Miyu Yamashita and Maki Ito will be challenging for the tag titles from the Magical Sugar Rabbits at the next Tokyo Joshi Korokin Hall show, which is on November 25th. Uh, it was announced that Niu Bishikigun is returning to France. So we will not be seeing Saki Sama or Mei San Michel, uh, at least in the near future. Maybe they will come back shortly. And as we talked about just a few minutes ago, Tokyo Joshi Inspiration 3 was announced. The big one for Kelly, Hikari Noah against Nao Kakuta in a hardcore match. Yeah. Hikari Noah heard your complaints, a big listener <laughs> of this podcast, and said, I will do another hardcore match. Hell yeah. Good. I thank you for listening. And then, also as we mentioned, on the 30th, they had a show where Miyu Watanabe challenged Hikari Noah for the International Princess Championship. That also will be happening at that November 25th uh, Corican show, which we will be previewing next episode. That should be a good uh, card, just based on those two matches. Yeah, it should, and it's. I think it's going to be, um, well, it will be, because Miyu is uh, still champion. It will be another show of no top title on the show. So it'll be interesting to see. They've been doing that more with Corican, which is pretty, pretty impressive to me that they have not, you know, had to burn a lot of big singles matches on the top of these Corican hall shows, which I think at the beginning of the year, I would have, I would have assumed that any Corican hall show they ran, they would have had to run with a big singles match on top. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that Tokyo Joshi show is on, uh, American Thanksgiving. That's awesome. It's on American Thanksgiving their time their time or our time? Well, cuz it's the 25th, right? Or am I wrong? Is it the tw- You mean Thanksgiving? Yeah. Well, the to- Did I just imagine the Tokyo Joshi show is the 25th? No, it's the 25th. Okay, yeah, so our, our Thanksgiving yeah. is the 25th. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is the 25th. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Lot to be there's a lot to be thankful for in Tokyo yeah. Joshi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Sendai Girls had a number of shows. Uh Eureka Oka was very busy defending her junior twi- junior title twice, uh, winning against Riko Kaiju and Canon. And also in the biggest news of Sendai Girls uh, last two weeks, Andres Miyagi and Hibiki defeating Mika Iwata and Manami for the tag titles. Happy to see that even with Mako Satomura gone, the tag titles change hands on almost a match-by-match basis in this company. <laughs> no one can hold them for longer than one or maybe two defenses. Nope. But I am happy to see, look, in all seriousness, I'm happy to see them doing more title matches because they had done almost none in the past year. Um, but anyway, uh, ice ribbon, the biggest thing of the last two weeks, the continuation of the Russell arena league queen of 10 minutes tournament. Uh, there was only one or two matches, so I won't run down all the results cause they're pretty similar to what they were last time, but we are coming very close, um, to the end of that. Also, it was announced that, uh, we're putting this here instead of the news, uh, that the Peas Party sub-brand will be coming to an end um, in the next month or so, and they will be launching a show that will somehow involve their this uh, union with CMLL. Not entirely sure what that means as of now, but we'll see. Maybe it means that some of the CMLL talent will be coming over with some level of frequency. 
A uh, bit sad to see P's party ending. I know there were a lot of people who were fans of them. They were very easy watches. Uh, you got to see some good amount of talent that maybe would not have appeared in Ice Ribbon normally, but we will see what the future holds for this CMLL show. Uh, Actress Girls, as we already sort of covered, Sayori No, uh, returning to Actress Girls, bringing Osaki Goon, kicking off this Osaki uh, Oz Academy, Osaki Goon, Actress Girls feud. Uh, Marvelous had a core, one of those Korokin Hall shows that we talked about. Nagisa Nosaki and Takumi Aroha won a one-day tag tournament over Ai Hosan and Eureka Oka. Uh, Kelly, do you have any Choco Pro updates for us? I do. I'm slightly behind, but today I made sure to watch the Halloween special from just this morning. Uh, the opener featured uh, Chris Brooks and Masahiro Takanashi defeating Shin Suzuki and Antonio Hondo, who were dressed as Masahiro Takanashi and Emi Sakura, respectively. So that was a little weird to see Emi Sakura back. <laughs> Singing songs, but not Queen, though. Got that oh, one. Oh, that's, right. that's the weirdest part. Yeah. Uh, and then they had a Halloween rumble, so I thought I would go over everyone's costume. Uh, Sayaka was dressed as a uh, Lulu pencil. That was very good. Uh, Chie was a creepy wind-up doll. Uh, Mei was a cat. Sayaka Obahiro was Rocky. Uh, Yuna was a Neurokabi, which took me a while to figure out. She was a yokai wall. Now, are you familiar with yokai at all? Uh, I am not, no. Okay, so yokai are like Japanese ghosts. Like they're like folktale myth monsters, kind of like cryptids over here in the States. Uh, but so she was dressed as a Nurokabe, which is just a wall with eyes. And the Nurokabe is like basically an impediment to travelers, like an invisible wall that'll keep you from going past a certain point. So that's what she was. And that took me a minute to figure out because at first I was just like, why is she dressed as a wall? And then Antonio Honda kept saying yokai on commentary. And I was like, oh, that's what she's doing. Okay. Uh, Kirihara was dressed as Freddy Krueger. Uh, Sayuri was a bat. And Chris Brooks was Chris Pencil. Wow. Big return there. Yeah. Big return. Yeah, it was fun, fun Halloween rumble. Fun show overall. Quick, easy watch. Just about like an hour or so. Yeah, it's always fun. They a lot of these promotions do fun Halloween things, which are always, you know, a little out of the ordinary. So uh, I usually enjoy them. Um, yeah, but that is everything that has happened over the last two weeks. Uh, upcoming, we will start with Stardom has a big show on November third, Kawasaki Super Wars. Uh, a big, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine match card. Uh, we'll start from the bottom up. Uh, the first match, match zero, actually, is Mei Sakurai against Waka Sukiyama. Kelly, you got anything to say about this match? I bet it's going to be all right. Great. The next <laughs> match is going to be Ruaka against Lady C for the future of stardom title. Kelly, are you pulling for Lady C? Yes, 100%. Lady C better win. Great. Uh, next is a four-way match. Sayakamatani, Micah. Mina Shirakawa and Konami. This seems like it could be a, a pretty fun match to me. I have to say, uh, we haven't gotten there yet, so this is a little bit spoiler. I think some of the undercard is better than the mid card in on in this show. Kind of, yeah. I, I like that they're going almost the I don't know GCW throw a scramble on the show man route. <laughs> Jimmy Lloyd's in that match too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next match, which might be the match I'm looking forward to most, Starlight Kid versus Momo Watanabe for the high-speed title. Momo Watanabe challenging for the high-speed title, uh, in my it's opinion, slightly below her station, but it should be a very good match. Yeah, I kind of like when upper-tier wrestlers go after lower-tier belts, because it usually just ends in, ends up with like a fun reign where... They're just wrestling a whole bunch of people they never get the chance to wrestle just because of their stations in the company. And we said that there weren't that many challengers for the high-speed title, and they've proven us wrong by putting Momo Watanabe in here. So good for them. Yeah. 
Uh, next is the match I'm I'm titling "Why Is This Not Match Zero? Uh, <laughs> it is Fuki Death and Saki Kashima against Hanan and Rina. That is the most opener match I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Holy shit! Yes, I'm not entirely. I think it. I think it's a. Um, I think the reason it is here is because it is a tag league match. I think. Oh yeah, they're um, still doing that, aren't they? At this point, huh? Yeah, so I think okay. that I think that's true. That makes um, sense. Someone will tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but yes, very weird to put that above Starlight Kid and Momo Watanabe. <laughs> yeah, that, even if it is Tag League, that should not be above a high-speed title match. Uh, next is just a tag feature match. Himika and Natsupoi against Mayu, Iwatani, and Koguma. Uh, you know, should be a fun match. There's not very much stakes, but... Yeah, should have should have mm. put them in the scramble too. Just go, go nuts. I will say I'm more excited for Starlight Kid and Momo Watanabe in the four way than I am for like I would have flip flopped. Yeah, totally. These matches. Um, and then we have three title matches at the top, and also a little briefcase. Uh, the first one, Suri versus Azumi for the title challenge briefcase and the SWA title. Uh, this is the first of three matches. I personally don't think the outcome is in doubt here. I think Suri wins, yeah. uh, but it should be, I think it should be a fun match. Yeah, no, I, this will probably be the match of the night. I think. Um, maybe I think probably if it isn't the best, it might, it will probably be the second best match of the night. So I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the only thing one. that I could see myself putting above it would probably probably be Starlight Kid and Momo. Uh, the semi-main is for the Wonder of Stardom title. Tom Nakino against U, the former Future of Stardom title holder, Unagi Sayaka. This is a big test for Unagi uh, in multiple ways. I'm going to be fast. I am fascinated to see how the show ends up doing because in my opinion the top three matches are not bad but i think none of them really are in any amount of doubt and they're really three people who are who have not been put at the top of the card on these bigger shows the challengers i mean obviously the champions have uh so i'm really fascinated to see what this match looks like i think unagi has been improving I don't know that she's been improving enough for me to put her in a semi main event uh, title match just personally, but we'll see how this goes. Certainly in my opinion, as we talked about before, doesn't much help Tom's reign look much stronger. No. It, oh, you lost to uh, Ruaka. Here's a semi man. Like that makes sense. That's too much yeah. of a jump. Like, if it was the high speed title, fine, whatever, I can see that. But the go to future, losing the future startup title to going up again into the semi main event is just too big of a jump. Well, and speaking of jumps, the main event for the world of stardom title will see Utami Hayashita taking on Hazuki. Azuki coming back, beating Koguma, and getting a World of Stardom uh, title match. This is another one. I don't think the outcome is much in doubt. Uh, but as I've talked about, I'm a big fan of Hazuki, and I think that this match will probably be very good. Yeah, this will probably be pretty good. Um, yeah, it's just there's no chance that Suri or Utami are losing until they have their match against each other. <laughs> So it's like not no defenses between there have any sort of drama to them. I guess if you know that sort of outcome, because I agree with you that it's going to be Utami Suri, then it's like, well, I guess you might as well just put the people at the top of the card who you know are going to lose anyway. Yeah, I guess. I just don't know. Like, um, I don't know what the building sits, but I'm like, if they came back and they were like, this show drew 800 people. I don't know that I would be like, oh my God, I'm so surprised. Like I'd be yeah. like, oh yeah, it wasn't really all that strong of a card. In like honestly, in for this card, I would be like, eh, it's a solid number. 
But I don't know. Maybe they come back and they're like, we drew 1500 again, which in that case would be, a, I mean, to me would be a very strong case for Uta- really Utami, Tom, and Shuri. Yeah, definitely. That's really what this card is about. It's about the three of them defending their titles. Um, so uh, we will see, but we will cover that show on the next episode of Jumping Bomb Audio. And then... Uh, Stardom has a lot of Tag League shows on November 4th, November 6th, November 7th, and the finals at Corican Hall on November 14th. I won't go through all the matches that are happening because it's uh, like 20 matches. (laughs) Um, But if you like Stardom Tag Wrestling, this is the next two weeks are for you. Yep. Um, And then the finals. So unfortunately, by the time we finish... Uh, or by the time we record again next time, uh, the tournament will be over. A very quick turnaround, especially compared to the uh, five star Grand Prix, which lasted quite a long quite a long time. <laughs> uh, Seedling has a show coming up with the continuation of their tag title tournament. Arisa Nakajima and Hanako Nakamori will take on you and Kira Yoniyama. And Asuka and Makoto will take on Ayami Sasamura and Riko Kaiju. Um, also, big show coming up as we talked about Ice Ribbon with a big show on November 13th. If this show, again, I always come on the show and I don't know whether it's on Samurai or not. If this show airs live, I would love to cover the show next episode because uh, it looks really great. The three... Uh, Actually, they just announced the Triangle Ribbon match today, and the Triangle Ribbon match is going to be Rina Shingaki defending against Mika Ozaki and Totoro Satsuki, and also Akane Fujita is going to be taking on Tekla to determine the next challenger for Rina Yamashita's Fantast Ice title. Uh, And two new rookies, Kaho and Kiku, will be debuting. Natsumi will take on Ibuki Hoshi, and then the two big matches of the show, Risa Sarah and Maya Yukihi defending their tag titles against Sayori Ano and Suzu Suzuki, and the main event, Tsukasa Fujimoto taking on Sakushi Haruka for the Ice Infinity title. I'm very excited because really two uh, semi-main and main event where I am not sure of what the outcome will be. Yeah, um, I feel like they're probably going to have Saori and Suzu win the tag titles just because they've really kind of been hot-shotting that team. Uh, And I think they're great together, so I really hope they win. The main, I have no idea who's going to come out of that one with the the title, but two awesome-sounding matches. Yeah, two great-sounding matches. I think uh, I agree with you on the tag title that Saori and Suzu uh, could probably win. Uh, it's that seems less up in the air to me than the main event, but either way, a very strong card, you know, rookies debuting, uh, Fujita and Tekla should be very good. So one I'm really looking forward to, I hope it is airing live on pay-per-view, uh, so we can catch it and review it next show. Uh, actress girls on November 6th has a title match Saki against Miku Aono and also the actress girls (laughs) stardom war. Uh, continues in that Natsumi Shozuki, uh, who last wrestled in stardom in 2013, is debuting oh, wow. for Actress Girls. So stardom takes some Actress Girls wrestlers, and Actress Girls says, we'll find someone who hasn't wrestled for you in eight years. And now they're <laughs> ours. Uh, so that should be good. But as I said, Actress Girls in need, I think of some talent as some talent is injured some of their bigger people. So good to get some more people in there. Uh, Wave has a Corican Hall show on November 7th. Saki and Hikari Shimizu will defend their tag titles against Yuki Miyazaki and Sakura Hirota. And Yumi Oka will defend the uh, Elizabeth title against Leon and Kaori Yonayama. And Kelly, do you have any Chaco Pro upcoming events? I actually do. On their Twitter, they announced the schedule through December 5th. Uh, But just for the next two weeks, they're running shows on the November 6th, November 7th, 
November 10th, November 13th, and November 14th. Uh, the November 14th show is going to run at 8 p.m. Uh, Japan time, which is a much different time because normally they start at 10 a.m. in Japan so they can air like at 8 p.m. or so here in the States. So that one could be interesting yeah, yeah. depending on what that means. Like maybe they're going to run like a actual venue that's not Ichigaya. Who knows? Well, we will have to see, but I think that that covers everything for the upcoming two weeks. As we mentioned, uh, we will be covering next episode, the big stardom show, as well as possibly the ice ribbon show from November 13th. So I think that covers it all. Kelly, anything more you want or need to say? Nothing really. Uh, yeah, I think we got through everything. Uh, I've been looking outside, been seeing some trick or treaters. They're not coming to my house. You know, because the lights cause, off. Because the lights off, and that's where <laughs> the scary man lives. Well, I'm Taylor, and for Kelly, this has been another fantastic episode of Jumping Bomb Audio, and we will see you in two weeks.